Good morning. Good to have you here this morning. The title of the sermon this morning is In the Meantime. In the Meantime. Uh, we are in Luke chapter 9, 7 through 11. Luke chapter 9, 7 through 11. And I've titled it In the Meantime because if we go back to look at what we did last Sunday, um, the apostles, the 12 disciples, are out uh, in the countryside of Galilee under Jesus' authority to preach the kingdom and heal the sick. We looked at that twofold mission that Jesus has sent them on. So they are out from him in the region of Galilee doing this twofold mission of preaching the kingdom and healing the sick. And we looked at these five points. Um, number one was they have the good news to proclaim. They have the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that Jesus is the Messiah. They have that. Then they have the dependence on God to provide. Um, he has sent them out with absolutely nothing so that they would realize and see God provide everything that they need. The third thing was a contentment with his provisions. They weren't to be consumers. They were to realize that when God gave them something, they were content with it, and, and they were to run with it rather than always trying to get more. The fourth thing was their discernment to keep pressing on. Jesus told them that they would be rejected at times. People would not accept the message of Jesus Christ, and therefore they were to not get discouraged and not go back home, but to just knock the dust off their feet from that town and press on to the next town. And then the last one was an obedience to God's plan, an obedience to God's plan, meaning they, they heard it, they got up, and they went, and so they obe obeyed. So while they are doing this, in the meantime, now we get to our passage, verse 7, Herod the Tetrarch heard about everything that was going on. Let me stop right there. They must have been very effective, <clears throat> these 12 disciples that were out there. They must have been, really been saying, this is in the name of Jesus Christ. Because um, prior to this, Jesus is basically a one-man show. Um, earlier, he had John the Baptist, but now John the Baptist is in prison. And uh, so he was a one-man show. He was the preacher. He was the healer. He was the demon caster. But now, now there are uh, 12 out there besides him. So 13 preachers and 13 healers and 13 demon casters and 13 death raisers. And maybe prior to this, Herod the Tetrarch was able to kind of pinpoint where Jesus was in his region when he got his reports. But now he's hearing about Jesus coming from every single direction. Um, and so it says here he was perplexed. Because, that, because some said that John, meaning John the Baptist, had been raised from the dead. Now, uh, Herod was a family name, so he was of the family of Herod. Uh, Tetrarch means that one-fourth of the region, that he ruled over one-fourth of that region. His dad was Herod the Great, Herod the Great, but he wasn't so great. I mean, he was uh, the Herod that was in charge of the whole region, when Jesus was born, and uh, he's the one who killed all the children trying to kill Jesus, and Jesus and his mom and dad uh, fled to Egypt for a time. Uh, he killed one of his own sons, um, if fearful that his son was going to take over the kingdom. And then uh, prior to his death, he killed the 70 Sanhedrin, the ruling council of uh, just prior to his death. So he wasn't so great. But when he did die, the region, was divided up into four parts. Um, and Archelaus was, uh, took Judea, and uh, he only served a couple years, and then uh, it got turned over to the Romans. And so we have Pilate, like Pilate the Roman, who's in charge when Jesus is on trial. Then we have Philip, who, who is over the northeast region of Galilee, kind of northeast of the Sea of Galilee. That was his region. And then Lysanias was west of Galilee, kind of north and, and between Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. And then we have Antipas, and that's who we're talking about in this passage of Scripture, Herod Antipas. And he was over the region of Galilee, and uh, that's the region that's kind of alongside of the Sea of Galilee. And he ruled there for 42 years. That's a long time. He, he ruled there the whole length of Jesus' ministry. And the word for perplexed, he says he's perplexed, is, is to be entirely out of his mind. He's entirely at a loss. 
He's probably getting his morning reports about everything that's happening in his region. And, and he's hearing one name, Jesus, Jesus. They're talking about Jesus in our town. They're talking about Jesus in our town. This is what's happening in our town. And rumor number one about who this Jesus is, is John the Baptist. And uh, you can see here how John the Baptist was a superstar in their day. And it made me kind of question, what did, what did John the Baptist do to become this superstar? It's kind of odd because we don't have any record, recordings of John the Baptist doing any miracles. We don't, we don't have anything like that. What we have is that John the Baptist came out of the desert. He was wearing camel hair. He probably smelled funny. He ate funny food. He, 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 instead of giving flowery language, he, he spoke directly to the people and told them to repent. He called some of them brood of vipers. He called for them to be baptized, every one of them, not just the Gentiles that were coming into Judaism, but even the Jews that they needed to be baptized. And so he had a really strong message. The reason he is in prison right now is because he was standing on the word of God and pointing out what the King Herod was doing wrong. So in verse 8, as we continue on, it says, some that Elijah had appeared and others that one of the ancient prophets had risen. So rumor number two was that this Jesus was Elijah, who was the chariot man, who was taken up into heaven on a chariot. And the thought was, well, he'll just come back down on his chariot. Or rumor number three was it was one of the ancient prophets had risen from the dead, like Jeremiah. And, and, and you know, this is even more far-fetched because we're talking about 700 to 1,000 years dead and coming back to life. Now, to show that this is common press of the day, this is actually what people were saying. When we go to Luke chapter 19, or verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 19, there, I got it. He said, they answered, uh, John the Baptist... When Jesus asked, who did the crowd say that I am? They said, John the Baptist, Elijah, still others, that one of the ancient prophets has come back. So this is common press of the day. This is what's on the evening news. This is what's in the Jerusalem uh, news or the Galilean Gazette. It's on the front page. Who is this Jesus? This is their answer. Which made me go on a tangent this week saying, well, who does the world say Jesus is today? Who is Jesus? So Barna did a survey a couple years ago. Uh, they, they did by online and by phone, uh, 4,000 people in America. They came up with these five things about what people think about Jesus. The first one was that Jesus was a real person. 92% believe that. 92% believe that Jesus was a historical person, that he walked this earth, that he, that he breathed this air. And so 92% believe that. Then then the next one was that Jesus is God. Um, 56% believe that. You would assume that that number would go down from the 92%. But 56% believe that Jesus is God, that he's not just a man, but he's also God. He's divine. And then the next one was that Jesus was sinless. Only 24% believe that. Only 24% believe that he was the sinless sacrifice, that, he, that, that the rest believe that he came here, but he sinned just like the rest of us, and he, he got tempted and he fell in his temptations and things like that. We could probably uh, thank the Da Vinci Code for that one, but uh, they, don't, they don't believe that he is the sinless sacrifice, but 24% do. Uh, then Jesus being personally known, that's the next thing, 62%. Now, this is where the numbers get a little muddy because you've got 62% saying that they have a personal relationship with Jesus, but 56% only believe that Jesus is God. So you got some people who are committed to Jesus, but they're not committed to Jesus who is a God. They're committed to Jesus who's just a good guy kind of thing. So it gets muddy at this point. And then the last one is that Jesus is part of the ticket. And 20% believe that. 20% of the population believes that Jesus, you need more than just Jesus. You need Jesus and maybe some good works of yours or, or that you are a good person. And therefore, that adds to what Jesus did um, because they can't see that God would be a just God who, who would hold to his justness of what is right and wrong and that some would go to hell. So uh, 
that's what the world thinks about Jesus. And it's a very, it's very different. It's a, and just like in the days when Jesus was on the earth, people had opinions about him. So do we today. That's why it's so important to go to the word of God. That is why it's so important to read the word of God and read his words and those words that are about him. So verse 9 says, this is why, John, uh, why Herod is so perplexed. He says, I beheaded John, Herod said. But who is this I hear such things about? And he wanted to see him. So he's perplexed because Herod was there. Herod was there when John the Baptist was beheaded. And if you want to go back and read the story, you're going back to Mark chapter 6, uh, 17 through 29. And we find out that uh, this is when John the Baptist pointed out to Herod and Herodias uh, that the marriage that they were in was unbiblical. And uh, Herodias did not like that so much that Herod put John the Baptist in prison. And Herodias wanted John the Baptist killed. But Herod had a certain respect for John the Baptist, realizing he was a holy and righteous man. And, it, and he would call him up every once in a while to talk and everything, but John the Baptist would never budge. And he would always point out that what he was doing by marrying his brother's wife was wrong. Well, an opportune time came during a party that was thrown for Herod, thrown by him for his birthday. And uh, he had... Herodias's daughter, which would be his niece, dance for them. I'm sure it was a very provocative dance. And, and at the end of that dance, it pleased Herod. And Herod said, I'll give you up to fourth of the kingdom. What do you want? And she ran back to her mother. And her mother, Herodias, said, the head of John the Baptist. And so the, her daughter came back in. And told him, I want the head of John the Baptist on the platter. And, and Herod was really distraught over that. He didn't want to do that. But because he made an oath in front of all of his friends and the people that were there, he told the executioner, kill John the Baptist. And that's what happened. They brought the head on a platter to Herod. Herod handed it off to his niece. His niece took it to his mother. And then, and then that was taken and then the disciples, John the Baptist, came in and took the corpse away and buried the corpse. Um, so he was there when that happened. So that rumor can't be true. I want you to put also on top of that that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And Matthew's account of this tells us that when John the Baptist's disciples buried his corpse, they came and they reported to Jesus what had happened. So he had just heard that his, dis, that his cousin had been viciously murdered because of sin. And uh, the question that Herod has is everybody's question. Who is this? Who is this man? And if we just do a little quick search back through Luke, we'll see this question come up many times. And it will continue on as we keep going. But Luke chapter 5, verse 21 says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? This is when Jesus healed the man of the paralytic man that was let down through the roof. And before he healed him physically, he healed him spiritually. He said, Your sins are forgiven. And they say, Who is this guy who can say this? Only God can say this. Then if you go to chapter 7, verse 20, chapter 7, verse 20, it says, When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? They're basically asking the question, who are you? Are you the one? Who, who, who are you? Tell us. And then the next one is in verse 49, same chapter. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives Sins. This is the lady who barges into the party and, and, and anoints his feet. And he turns to her and says, your sins are forgiven. And then, then they ask the question, who is this man? Then if you go to chapter 8, verse uh, 25, uh, he said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, where is your faith? 
And they were fearful and amazed, asking one another, who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. And then if we go to chapter 9, um, it, Jesus is going to draw out this question. When we look at verse 18, he says, who do the crowd say that I am? And then in verse 20, he turns it around and he says, but you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? This is the question of all time that everybody has to address. Who is Jesus? And it's note here that Herod keeps this in the singular. He doesn't say, who are all these people that are out there? You no, know, he points right back to it and says, who is this? I want to meet him. He points it right back to Jesus. So the disciples must have been doing a great job at giving all the credit to Jesus. All the credit to Jesus. So when they taught, this is, this is Jesus' teaching. Or when they healed, this is what Jesus, this is in the name of Jesus. And probably a great example of that is in Acts chapter 3. This is after Jesus' death and life, death and resurrection and ascension. And uh, Peter and John are in Jerusalem and they're at the temple and they're at the gate called Beautiful and there's a lame man that's there and he's begging for money. And, and Peter comes up to him and says, silver and gold have I none. But you remember in the name of who? Of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And he rises up and walks. So they did a really great job at pointing them to Jesus. And that's, that's an important point because us as a church, that's what we are to do. This church is not about the pastor. This church is not about the building. This church is not about the location. This church is about Jesus. This church isn't about us in, in, in the fact of what we can do, what great things we can do. No, what, what people should experience when they come into this church or come into this building or come into uh, contact with us is not about us, but they should come in contact with the name of Jesus, that they should hear about Jesus, that they should know Jesus. It's all about him. So verse 10 says, uh, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus, all that they had done. He took them along and withdrew privately uh, to a town called Bethsaida. I like to alliterate things. I like to see patterns that are there. Let me give you five here. They respond. The disciples respond. When they heard Jesus' destruction, instruction, uh, they got up and they went. They responded. And then they returned. It was a short-term mission trip. And they came back to Jesus. They returned. And then they report. They report what was done. You could hear them say, I, we went to this town and we went to this town and these were the people that we met and this is what happened in this miracle and, and this is what happened when we taught this. And so they report and then they retreat. They retreat. Jesus says, let's get away. But make note that it's a, a retreat is a time with Jesus. That's what a retreat is here. Um, it's a dangerous thing to retreat without Jesus. I've heard that a few times, people saying they just want to get away from it all. And, 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 and I mean, they've kind of put Jesus on the shelf for a while. That's a dangerous thing. When we retreat, we need to make sure we retreat with Jesus so we get our refreshment from him. And then the, and then the last one here is they will repeat. They will repeat. They will be given the great commission to take the gospel to the whole world, and they will repeat again. And as I looked at that list again, I thought, oh, that's us. That's us as Christians. That's us as a church. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to respond. We're supposed to hear God's instruction and get up and go out and do it. We're to say, Lord, Lord, and also do what he says. And then we're to return, and that's what's great. We get to return. We get to return every week back to this place and be around the people of God, so we re return. Uh, and, and what do we do when we return? Well, hopefully we report. We report what God has done. We report because we have responded to his instruction, and we report about these different things that God has done in our lives, or God has brought people into our lives, or God has done this, and we give this report, and, and, and because we give this report, then we re retreat. And every Sunday is a, a retreat where we retreat with God. We retreat with Jesus. We sing songs of him. We read words of him, and, and we get refreshed by him. And then what do we do? We repeat. We go back out with what? The Great Commission. We're taking this gospel to our community and to the whole world. Um, let me say a few words about Bethsaida, uh, this town that they retreated to. Bethsaida was a fishing town. 
on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's the hometown of Peter, Andrew, and Philip, and most believe Nathaniel. So there's a possibility that four of the 12 disciples came out of this one little town. It's uh, named after the daughter of Caesar Augustus and Philip the Tetrarch, um, who was ruler over that, and it gave it that name. Um, please note, too, that Herod Antipas wants to see Jesus, but Jesus now has moved out of his region, just out of his region of Galilee, into the region that Philip has. And then here's another terrible thing about the town of Bethsaida. And just kind of set the scene for this. You've got possible four out of the 12 disciples come out of this little town. And also, we will look at this next week, but, but he's going to perform the greatest miracle of all time, the feeding of the 5,000, which it's 5,000 men. Most believe that it could be 15, 20, 25,000 when you add in the women and children. Outside of this small town called Bethsaida, and, and, and most likely, it, that miracle encompassed all of Bethsaida. I mean, or anybody in Bethsaida would have known about this miracle that is given recording in all four Gospels along with the resurrection of Jesus. That's how important and big this is. And so this is happening just outside of their town. And what does Jesus say about Bethsaida? In chapter 10 of Luke, he's sending out the 72 or 70 or 72. And he says in verse 13, Woe to you, Chorazin, that's another town. And then he says, Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, now those were evil towns. If they, these things would have been done in, in those places, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So he said, if, if, if they would have had four out of the 12 come out of their towns, and they would have had this huge miracle done right outside of their gates, they would have turned to me. They would have repented. They would have mourned. They would have said, we want you as our savior. Uh, they would have responded differently. And then if we look at verse 14, but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So how did Bethsaida the one that had four out of the 12 disciples come out of it and had the greatest miracle of all time outside of its, uh, outside of its region, just within the, the region of Bethsaida. How did they respond to Jesus? They, they get a woe from Jesus. And then verse four, 11, let's end this out. It says, when the crowds found out, they followed him and he welcomed them, spoke about, to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Now, they went by water uh, across the tip of the Sea of Galilee, about four miles across uh, by water. It would have been eight miles by land. And so you, and the land is elevated above the water. So maybe you could see that. They could see Jesus out in the boat, or that's the boat that has Jesus in it. And they just hightail it all the way around the tip of the lake, uh, keeping eyeball on that boat that's there so that they could be there on the shore when he, wherever he lands. And so look what Jesus does. He welcomes them. He welcomes them. I mean, he doesn't even get a chance to get his foot off, and there's the people again. He welcomes them. That word welcome means to receive, to an extend a hand to. He's, he's basically saying to them, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, uh, come in, sit down. Glad you, glad you are here. I want you to be know that you are welcome here. But, but then that next phrase is really important. Jesus spoke to them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He, 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 communication happened. See, we are to be a welcoming place. We are to welcome people in. To what? To tell them about the kingdom of God. To speak to them about Jesus. And then, that last part of the verse there, and healed those who needed healing. So the, here's the twofold mission in action. Here's the twofold mission in action. He had told them, his disciples this back in chapter 9, verse 2, and then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then in verse 6, so they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. And then they come back and report, and then they go on this retreat, and what does Jesus do as soon as he gets out of the boat? He continues to do this, to speak to them about the kingdom of God and to have compassion on the poor, to heal the sick. This is really important to Jesus. 
And it needs to be really important to us. So important that I think we need to ask God for a combo this week. A combo. We need to ask God, God, give me someone to come across my path that I would say your name to, that I would share the kingdom of God with this week. And the combo part is that maybe they have a physical need. Maybe there's a way that I can help them. Maybe they're poor in some area and I can use my life, my time, my resources, uh, what you have given to me to reach out to them in a very compassionate way. Give me a combo this week. And maybe that combo will start with the need, but if it does that, then, then Lord, open up the door so I can tell them about you. But I think we really need to pray about a combo this week. And I want to finish the sermon with looking at our mission statement. Because I want us to really embrace this mission statement because I see that it comes right out of the scripture. And actually, it encompasses this twofold mission that Jesus gave his disciples. Our mission statement is to know Christ and to grow in Christ and to go for Christ and to show Christ's love. Now, if you look at those first three, know Christ, grow in Christ, and go for Christ... Uh, that's the preach part of the twofold mission that we are to preach that you need to hear about Christ to know him you need to grow in him so you need to hear more about him and and then you are to go out from here in the name of Jesus Christ to share that gospel with others so that's that part of our mission statement is all about that preach the gospel and then that last part show Christ's love that's the touch part that's the touch part of the twofold mission. That's the compassion to the poor uh, part of the mission. And you say, well, Adam, it's three to one. That's great. It's not two to two, Adam. It should be two to two. No, I think in the scripture it is three to one. There's many times that Jesus is really pushing them to spread the gospel, to speak his name unto others. And we will have those opportunities to extend our hands. Uh, in, in compassionate ways to those that are in need. But there again is this twofold mission is in the mission of our church to know Christ, go in, grow in Christ, go for Christ, and show Christ's love. But let me show you one more thing about this mission statement. If you take the first two, know Christ and grow in Christ, what would be the action point of that in our church? Well, the main action point is that if we're, that is going to happen, then we need to attend worship this time. Now, I know we, we have Bible school and we have uh, kids club and we have uh, Sunday school and we have small groups and we have all those other things. And those are really great. And I want you to do those kind of things. But, but the main one for our church is for us to come together in this place with the body of Christ at this time and to lift up our voices to him in song and to, and to, and to just dive into the scriptures that we have. Our main action point to, to know Christ and to grow in Christ is to attend worship. And I really encourage you to, to every time available to be in the God's house with God's people and worship him. And then the third part of our mission statement, go for Christ. The action point there is that we have an outward focus, that this church isn't about us. It isn't about what happens actually inside of here. It's that we, we look out. We realize that we are saved. And if we are saved, we are saved. And, and that, but there are those who are not saved. And there are those out there that need to hear the gospel and need to see the compassion of God's love given to them. And so we always have this outward focus of the community that is around us. And then the last part, show Christ's love. The action point there in our mission statement would be that they would see Christ in all areas of our lives. So we would be Christ-like when we're on the stage performing. Or we would be Christ-like when we're coaching uh, the softball team. Or we would be Christ-like when we're at our workstation. Or we would be Christ-like when we're in our, at, the, at school as a student. We would be Christ-like anywhere and everywhere. That they, we would be Christ-like when they read our comments on Facebook. We would be Christ-like uh, in all areas of our lives. That they would see Christ's love. 
So I just wanted to go back through that again so that you see our mission statement and you see that it, is in, it, it comes out of the twofold mission that Jesus gave his disciples that was so important. And let me end with this. Let's be a church that responds, that we respond to Jesus' instructions, that we're a church that gets up and goes out. And then let's be a church that returns, that comes back on a regular basis to gather up together. And let's be a church that has something to report because we have responded. Let's report about the different people Jesus has bring, brought into our lives or the different times that we've been able to share about Jesus or how Jesus has answered a prayer. Let's re come back and report. And then let's retreat. Let's be a church that really retreats with Jesus that we sing of Jesus, that we read of Jesus, that we, that we just, we speak to each other about Jesus. And then let's be a church that repeats, that we get up and we go back out because the Great Commission is ever before us. Let's be that kind of a church. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and for this passage of Scripture. It seems to be just a filler, Lord, till we get to the this great miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, but we realized this morning there's some really important things here about our declaration of who you are and that uh, we don't ascribe to what the world thinks you are, but you are our Savior. And help us, Lord, to pray this week that we would have a combo, that we would have that opportunity to say your name uh, to someone else that you bring along our path, and also, Lord, that we would be able to use our hands, we would be able to use our resources, Lord, to help someone who is in need. And that, may that be a combo that we put that together. Lord, thank you so much for being with us this morning. May our eyes now turn outward to the community that you are sending us out to. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen.